want to look this morning at uh, our key verse, our chapter will be 1 Kings and chapter number 19. And the key verse will be down in verse number 4. Now this is the story of Elijah. Uh, he has come and, and uh, God has told him that it's not going to rain on the earth for a period of three and a half years until he says it's going to rain. And so, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, and I wonder if you've said this before, it is enough. It is enough. Now, o Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. I want to go back first of all and look at the life of Elijah for just a moment this morning. Uh, we got to back up and, and, and we're going to find in the scripture, uh, really there's nowhere we find in the scripture where Elijah approached God and said, you know, I think I would like for you to put me on the spot with the world. I, maybe let's do something crazy, God. Maybe why don't we do something like, how about it not rain on the earth for three and a half years until I say so? Now, that's kind of crazy, isn't it? I mean, we, we think that uh, sometimes that, that God come up and, and maybe Elijah come to God and said something like that. It didn't happen that way. God chose him. God chooses you and I to be tested. Why? To prove to this lost and blind world that there is a God in heaven. On rare occasions, we do some action to bring a trial. That can't happen in our life. We can do some things to bring a trial into our life. Sometimes those trials can last for years. Sometimes we make poor, bad, reckless decisions. And it causes us, and it causes our loved ones and our family to be in turmoil for a while. Because God is doing something in our life, and God is teaching, but most of the time, God sends the trials, and He sends the trials so that you and I can show this lost and dying world that there is a God in heaven. You remember the the uh, the blind man, and the, they asked Jesus. They said, "Well, Lord, who sinned, him or his father, or his, his father, his mother, his parents? Who sinned?" He said, "Neither. This sickness was for the glory of God." You remember Lazarus when he died. Uh, Lazarus didn't go up and ask God, I'm sure, that, Lord, would you kill me and let me go to paradise? And, and Lord, would you come back four days later and raise me up out of paradise? No, I report to you that I'm sure Lazarus did not want to leave paradise. I'm sure when he got that call from Jesus Christ to come out of paradise, he didn't want to come back to this world. So things happen. I'm sure that Elijah didn't go before God and say, let me have this trial. I want to be tested for three and a half years. I want to see what my faith will be like and stand before the world and see what will happen to me. No, I don't believe it happened that way. I believe Elijah and God were maybe talking one day and God just showed up on the scene and said, Elijah, do this. Elijah said, okay, we'll do it. So, I hope you don't ask for trials because uh, yeah, maybe you got a little more faith than I do if you're going to ask for some trials. But remember this, most of the time God chooses your storm. If you're doing what you know to do is right, and a certain storm comes your way, you can count it all joy. <laughs> for he's still working on you. When Paul got on the ship in Acts 27, headed to Rome, you remember that story? Well, he was headed, he was a prisoner, and it's time to go to Rome. God told him, uh, told him, said, don't, there's, there's going to be a storm. And he warned the captain of the ship, and he told him, he said, look, let's don't go. Nevertheless, they, they listened to the captain of the ship. They got on the ship anyway. And God promised Paul that no one would die, except the ship would be battered. You know the story there in Acts 27. Well, uh, 
That didn't happen right away. The Bible says in verse number 7 that they sailed slowly for many days. They sailed slowly for many days. Now, they was on that ship for 14 days. And Paul records that in the book of Acts. Well, Luke does in the book of Acts about that, that storm. But there was days on there before the storm came. Then God showed him. He warned him of this storm that was coming. I wish I could report to you that God provides his children with a warning about any approaching storm. But thank God he doesn't. You know, we, we just had a storm come through Mexico uh, this week. The most powerful hurricane, hurricane ever recorded in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, even, even greater than Katrina that just came through hit Mexico and sustained winds of over 200 miles an hour, the lowest pressure of any storm that has ever come and hit the Western Hemisphere. We had something that we have today called a warning. We had a warning from the National Weather Service. We had Doppler radar. We sent in hurricane hunters to drop balloons and seen the storm coming. But you know what? We don't have a storm like it, a storm warning when it comes to storms in our life. We just have to uh, be walking with God and allow God, if He's going to send the storms, allow Him to tell us when they're about to happen. So uh, we have a Doppler radar, if you will. We have God's Word. And if we walk with God, when we come into a storm, we can figure out why. Uh, maybe in time why the storm come. A lot of times it's years down the road you look back before you can see why the storm comes. So here's Elijah. Let's review his biography. According to chapter 16, Elijah found himself alive during the reign of the most wicked ruler in Israel ever. You say, how do you get that? Well, verse number 33 in chapter 16 of 1 Kings says, and Ahab made a, uh, a grove. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings that were before him. I believe if God says this man done more to provoke him to anger than all the kings before him. Let's put them all together. This man provoked the Lord God. So God says, you know what? It's time for a showdown. This is where Elijah uh, found himself at in his life. Elijah did not ask for this storm to come. Elijah did not ask for this trial to come. We want to get on Elijah and say, ha, he didn't have too much faith. He went and got under a juniper tree. I'm here to tell you, it can happen to any one of us. Don't think you ever too tall that you cannot fall. I want to say that again. Don't you ever think that you're too tall that you cannot fall. I'm sure Goliath thought he was too tall that he couldn't fall. But God placed a stone in the correct place. And the giant fell and got his head cut off. And that was great victory. And all the Philistines fled. You know that story. But here we find Elijah. In the midst of his life, in the midst of the most wicked ruler that's ever reigned in Israel. So if I were God, and trust me I'm not, I might may, I may say the same thing about our king today. I mean think about this. I know a lot of you ain't going to like this, but a name like Hussein, come on, that don't get more American than that, right? <laughs> let me tell you, let me parallel a few things in America where they have. If I may, I found a report dated January 12, 2014. Since Roe v. Wade was passed in 1973, there has been 56,662,169 abortions in America. I know what you're thinking right now. Ho hum. So what? Here it goes again. Here goes the story about. Uh, abortions again. Well, I'm going to tell you that's been 41 years. Now, I don't know if I'm going to add a couple of years because this is 2014 
In a few months, this, this uh, trial will be two years old. So in 41 years, that's 1,382,000 in four abortions a year. You times that times two to, if we stayed on the same scale, coming up to uh, this coming January 12th of 2016, if God doesn't come back, we keep on the same scale. That's an extra 2,764,008. Equaling 59,426,177 abortions that has been recorded since Roe v. Wade in 1973. And we want to say, God bless America. In America today, every religion is accepted as equal, except when you distinguish. The name of Jesus Christ. They want to call our ball players out. Tell them they can't pray on the field. They want to try to stop us from doing judgment journey. Because of the noise. Because of some atheists get up and do their thing. You see every religion is, uh, is uh, separate from the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when his name is mentioned. It's not a religion. It's a person. It's the Christian's. It's those that's supposed to be Christ-like. In America, it's been proven we perform abortions so distinctly as to not harm certain body parts so they can be sold on the market. We have a Supreme Court who says, I don't care what God says. Homosexual partners must have the same equality as any normal couple. Who cares what thus saith the Lord? We now say wrong is right. And right is wrong. Everyone must change what they think and know is right because it might offend someone else. Some of you wonder why Donald Trump is leading in the polls. I'm done with the politics of the message this morning. That's where we, Elijah found himself. We're in such a wicked society today. We find ourselves in that. I don't see it recorded in Elijah's day where Almost 59 million babies have been aborted. And the people getting up and saying we're a Christian nation. But you know what? That's what we find ourselves in today. So what are we going to do? Remember, we're looking at a biography of the life of Elijah. So in chapter 17, verse number 1, Elijah makes this bold statement. There shall not be dew nor rain on uh, these years, but according to to my word. Now, that's a pretty powerful statement. That's a pretty bold statement that Elijah is saying there. He says, you know what? He comes out. God told him to say this. He comes out and he says, before the God of whom I stand, as the Lord God of Israel liveth. See, they thought God was dead because God uh, wasn't taking care of his people. He wasn't coming in and pronouncing judgment because of Ahab's sin and wicked reign and done more to provoke God. But you know what? He pushed God's button. He pushed God's button. It was time for a showdown. It was time for judgment. Now I want to report to you later we're going to see this. But there was over 7,000 that never bowed the knee to Baal. There was, uh, we're going to get to it in a moment hopefully if we don't run out of time. But there was over 7,000 that didn't bow the knee to Baal in that day. There was a hundred prophets that uh, this man of uh, God hid in the caves. We're going to see that. Elijah felt alone. But there was people in there that was affected by the judgment of God. Who was praying to God. Who was following God. So that might just be a warning for you and I. Yes, the, the righteous, it rains on the just and the unjust alike. And we have to know that and understand that. Well, here's Elijah. He got up. God said, it's showtime. It's time to show this wicked king who is the true God of the universe. So in chapter 17 and verse 1, Elijah makes that statement. There shall not be even due nor rain these years, but according to... To my word. Now what happened? How did the plants get watered and all? Before the rain came. You remember when Noah came? 
Uh, and Noah preached that judgment of God was coming. Hey, the only thing that watered the ground was the dew. It never rained. God brought the rain. God brought the flood. And things continue now as it is in that time. Of course, we know the earth will never be flooded again. But here, he said, there's not even going to be dew on the ground. So number one, I want you to think about this. Elijah had to believe God would keep him alive at least that long. What kind of bold statement is that for him to come out and say, you know what? It's not going to rain until I say it's going to rain, big boy. Now, I'm sure that made the king laugh. But you know what? Right? Uh, Elijah had enough boldness to know whatever trial God was going to send his way, God was going to sustain him. So don't forget that point. God would keep him alive, and he knew that. Number two, God feeds Elijah as we go on down through uh, this man's life. God feeds Elijah at the brook Cherith. The unclean ravens bring him food. Now parallel to this, God still uses unclean people to meet the need of you and I. There's many of people you and I work for uh, that put money in our pocket who have no interest in serving God. So you got to understand that God used the raven. The raven was the unclean bird. Uh, and so uh, God gives him this instruction. God tells him it's time to move. God sends him to Cherith there. Uh, and I believe a couple of years went by there. That's just my opinion. I'm not a Bible scholar, never claimed to be one. But you go ahead and, and put whatever dates you wanted on there. I'm telling you, he went... God fed him. He went to the University of the Lord here. And God started sustaining him. God used the unclean birds to bring him food and had him water while everything else was drying up around him. God sustained him. So the brook dries up. And verse 7 says, After a while it came to pass, after a while, doesn't give a timetable, that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Must have been a mighty good brook, mighty good water coming out of there. But God uses uh, even unclean people and things to supply the need of his people, and he always does that. Now the third thing, there was another need that must be met. God prepared Elijah to meet that need. As we go look up and come up on this story in verse number 8, uh, Elijah goes to this widow. Now there was only a need that Elijah could meet. And if not, God would have used somebody else. But Elijah was prepared. He was the only one that could. If God had not dried up the brook chariot, then Elijah would have stayed there, enjoying the provisions of Jehovah Jireh. You remember, that's the God that provides for us. So if the brook hadn't dried up, Cherif would, and the brook Cherif hadn't dried up, Elijah would still be there, enjoying those provisions. Elijah brought encouragement to this widow. He might have said something like this. Ma'am, let me tell you how God has sustained me these past few years. You see, I believe it's been at least a couple of years have gone by. Creeks and rivers were drying up. Wells were drying up. All kind of animals were dying. No crops were growing. Elijah looked everywhere and seen nothing but death. But I'm sure the business of the undertaker was thriving at this time. I digress on that. But he was proof that God could sustain, that God could and would take care of his children in the midst of a drought. And think about this note. There's possibly the reason that this woman was a widow is because of Elijah. You ever thought about that? Maybe this lady was a widow because of the prayer that Elijah had not prayed and of course of the prayer that he did pray. God told him that you're going to do this. Elijah prayed. There's not been dew. 
There's not been rain. Wells are dried up. Everything's death around him. I'm sure he's seeing all the carcasses of the animals laying around, dying and dead. Yet he goes to this widow's house. And, and I love the story there. He, he comes up. And uh, verse number 8, The word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zion, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. And again, the possibility might be, because of the drought, her husband's done that, everything he could do to provide for him and for her and his child. And now he's dead. He's gone. She's a widow. She arose and, uh, so he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow was there, gathering of the sticks. He called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, watch this first thing, a little water. <laughs> Wait a minute, everything's dried up. Everything's dead around. But you see, life, just as much as there's life in the flesh, in the blood, the blood is the life thereof in our flesh. It must have water. So the first thing the prophet asked for is water that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord God liveth, I have not a cake. I only have a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. You think the woman ain't never experienced death? Her husband's dead. She knew what was taking place. She seen the death pain come. She heard the gurgle of death. You know what I'm talking about. You have been beside, maybe some of you have, some of your loved ones have been in the hospice room and they got that just that gurgle of death. They can't hardly breathe anymore. She sat there and buried her husband. And now I'm fixing to bury her child and her. And here comes this man who is responsible for the drought. Say it if you have it how you want to. He's not responsible. God's responsible. But it's according to what God has told him to do. This man has proclaimed this. So this woman said, it's enough. I'm fixing to make this. I'm going to eat it. My son's going to eat it and die. Elijah said in verse 13, Elijah said unto her, Fear not. Have you ever been in such a midst of a storm? Fear is overwhelming you. So much is going on in your life. And God comes to you and says, Fear not. I'm, I'm happy to report to you that he does. But he said unto her, Fear not. Why? Because Elijah's dealt with some fear in his life. Elijah has seen God sustain him all around. He said, Fear not. Go and do as thou hast said, but make me a little cake first. You know the story. And gets on down. He said, The cruise of the oil shall not fail until the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. Listen, the end of the storm is coming, is what he's telling her. Then the lady's uh, widow, the widow's lady's son dies. Well, this is after a while now. The Bible says that she went and did according in verse 15 of Elijah. She and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of the meal wasted not. Neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. So the provision of God was always there. Was still there every day. Yet, the ladies son still died. Think about that now. What she say in verse 18? Well, let's read verse 17. It came to pass after these things that the son of the woman of the mistress of the house fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. He was dead. She said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance? And to slay my son. Well, long, the root of the story is Elijah goes up, lays on the child three times. The child comes back to life. Then we pick up the story in chapter 18. 
In verse number one, it came to pass after many days. Watch this now. Let's get the timetable together. That the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year. So three years have gone by here. Now it's time in chapter 18 to meet the king. It's time. I believe God, it took three years for God to work on the heart of the king. You see, people with a lot of power, a lot of substance, a lot of money, they can make it longer than others. So it took three years for this to get to the time God said it's showtime. So uh, at this time also in chapter 18, Jezebel had killed the prophets of the Lord. But God had another man in position, Obadiah. The Bible says he feared the Lord greatly. He took 100 prophets and hid them in the caves by 50. The great showdown between God and the prophets of Baal takes place through verse 39. And I'm moving quickly on through here. Now we get to verse number 40. You know the story there. They, they dug trenches. Uh, they filled the water uh, up, the trenches up with water. Where did they get the water from? Somebody had stored the water. Maybe it was the king that stored the water. Matter of fact, the king told Obadiah, you go throughout the land and see how many, uh, you, you go, you take this side of the land, I'm going to take this side of the land, we're going to find out. Uh, what kind of brooks is still there? What kind of wells is still there? Well, they go and do that. And, and Obadiah had hid these 100 prophets and gave them water and bread to eat, sustained them because Jezebel had killed a lot of them. So he went and hid them. Where did he get the water? Probably from the king's hand. You see, even the, un the wicked king, God was still taking care of his children through that. So you know the story. They get down. God sends down fire. The water's lapped up. The wood's lapped up. The stones are lapped up. Everything is gone. <clears throat> and now we get to verse 40. Down here it says, And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them. And Elijah brought them. Elijah now brought them down to the brook of Kishon, and slew them there. So after this great battle, after this three years of drought, after God helped sustaining him, he gets down, he has the showdown. He takes these 450 prophets of Baal and kills each one of them. Now you want to talk about, how about number 50 done gone by? How about number 200 done gone by? How about number 300 done gone by? And you still away and killing each one of these prophets don't sound too glorious he had to have some kind of special power to do that some kind of touch of God because I would imagine uh, after all these men have been through these years of drought God breaking them God molding them doesn't seem the, the battle take place on Mount Carmel and here they're slaying they're waiting in line and I'm sure they're begging for their life. I'm sure their wives and children that are left are begging for Elijah not to kill them. But Elijah kills every one of them. They've already been stricken by drought, stricken by hunger. And yet, they get to here and Elijah kills every one of them. That doesn't sound like something that would be too glorious. I'm sure Elijah didn't ask for that, but that happened. And now we move on, and I'm going to move on real quickly. Chapter, uh, uh, verse 42 through 46, the end of that chapter, God said, uh, Elijah sent his servant, said, go and look. And he went and looked, and there was a cloud, and it was like a man's hand. The drought was over. The battle was over, Elijah thought. The storm clouds come up. And then the word got back in chapter 19 to Jezebel what had taken place. See, they didn't have Facebook and, and all this. They couldn't just get it instantaneously like we do today. Jezebel gives us this message, you're going to die tomorrow. He flees. He's down. He's worn out. He's done, been through all this drought. Done seen all this death. Done been through this great victory on Mount Carmel. But yet he just turned around and killed 450 people. 
He's done. The rain's coming. The battle's over. He said in verse 4, He himself went a day's journey in the wilderness, came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die. He said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than any of my fathers. He's seen the bloodshed. He's seen the starvation. He's seen the victories. He said, I can't take any more. I'm done. Have you ever been to that part? I'm sure you've been there. But what you and I need to do is we need to look ahead. And thank God he didn't stay under that juniper tree. Don't you ever get on Elijah for being under the juniper tree. You never went through what he went through. You and I go through a little trial here and we get a, a, a little verbiage of uh, maybe some kind of slander or persecution and we want to quit God. Come on. What we need to do is like Elijah. No, there were 7,000 out there that never bowed a knee to Baal. There was 100 prophets hid in the caves that never bowed a knee to Baal. You are not alone. We need to lift up our eyes unto the hills from whence our help comes from. Our help comes from the Lord. Jezebel got her day. She was eaten by dogs that she raised. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together. Bless us as we go into this worship hour. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.